Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. We're back with episode 30 of the Leo Training Podcast. This week's guest is Theo Pickles, high-performance strength and conditioning coach with the Netherlands rowing team. We cover a host of topics and subjects in this interview. We'll discuss how Theo progresses his athletes throughout the training year, uh, moving from more generalist to uh, specified training as the racing season approaches, uh, how to sync up your training on a day-to-day basis, and make sure that uh, fits in and complements the activities that the rowers are doing within their sport on any given day, uh, and what um, type of lifts that he emphasizes in his training program. So without further ado, let's roll to episode 30 with strength and conditioning coach Theo Pickles. Theo Pickles, welcome to the Leo Training Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on. I know you're extremely busy right now with the the ramp up to the Rio Olympic Games. Yeah, great. Thanks very much for having me. So before we get uh, started and rolling into our topics, why don't you take a moment, um, introduce yourself, let everybody know who you are, uh, what type of athletes you're working with, and currently what you're kind of uh, preparing for. Okay, so... uh, Basically, I'm working for the uh, the Netherlands Olympic Committee uh, as uh, one of the strength and conditioning coaches, and we provide services to uh, uh, sporting bodies around the country. I specifically work with the the National Rowing Board and the National Swimming Board, um, and uh, and providing strength and conditioning services to the to those two uh, those two bodies. Um, Previous to that, uh, sort of going way back, uh, I did my uh, bachelor's in, uh, in human movement science at uh, Southern Cross University in, in Australia, uh, and then shortly afterward, my master's in sports uh, science. Oh, sorry, master's in sports coaching uh, at the University of Queensland, and uh, through that period as well, I became level two strength and conditioning coach through the uh, Australian Strength and Conditioning Association. Since then, I've worked in uh, with a whole variety of athletes, um, particularly uh, in Queensland with the um, the uh, Queensland Paralympic uh, athletes uh, in track and field, uh, uh, and then onwards uh, to Bangladesh to work with the um, with the cricket team there uh, for a couple of years, uh, and then after trying stuff a business in Belgium as strength conditioning coach, which didn't go so well. Uh, I ended up uh, back into the, into the Netherlands here uh, with um, with some of the best athletes in the world. That's awesome, man! So exciting. So you've definitely um, been been passing on your your knowledge and experience sort of around the world. You've been to some very interesting places. So I got to ask. I, I had no idea until you just shared that. So what's what's been some of the the differences? Like, I mean. What's your favorite place to go eat for, for food if you had to pick one of the spots you've been to? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I, I do like a good, good curry. So I, I guess something in Bangladesh may have stuck. Um, that's for sure. But you know what? I, Australian seafood is, is some of the best in the world as well. So, uh, so that makes me pretty happy too. And a, and a good meat pie, of course. Nice. That's awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Um, okay, so... Let's kick things off. Um, we're right around the corner uh, before the, the Rio games get underway here. Um, so these are some very uh, relevant and timely topics that we're getting into. So let's talk about how you are programming um, for, the, for the rowing team. They're getting ready to you know, kind of peak, go into to the game. So really important to balance the, the recovery component um, while you are – getting in the, the strength training uh, work and making sure that they're still prioritizing the, the endurance work, you know, on the erg or in the boat. 
Um, so what, so what are the, some of the things that, that you are doing and that others out there should be trying to keep in mind in their own training practice? So my, the, uh, my main instruction with coaches is they have to row. The boat's got under, uh, no soreness, uh, no stiffness, uh, that boat has got run. And, and we, we always see after strength training that the next session, which will be following them, uh, that the boat never quite runs as well, but we try to minimize that effect as much as we can. We just find a stiff with it, less coordination. Um, so right now in this period, we're, we're down to two strength sessions a week uh, for both the men and the women's session. Uh, and some even have only one session a week. The guys who pull up really stiff we, or are extremely strong, we, uh, we just maintain them. We don't want to get them any stronger than they are. It's not, it's not that we ever worry about them being too strong, but that it's just they can do other things that will improve their own more than strength training. Um, so the way that I'm sort of focused at the moment is we have our lighter speed, uh, power session on, uh, for the girls, they do it on Monday for the guys that are on Tuesday, just so there's too big a squad, they can't all hit the gym at the same time. And the idea of that session is we have almost no eccentric phases in their training. Uh, so jumping if they do cleans they, they drop all of the weights um and uh it actually it is a very short program there'll be uh, two legs two power exercises so at the moment they do uh four sets of cleans four sets of jump squats uh one push one pull that's the session nice so they're they're probably in there like maybe 45 minutes total yeah yeah Absolutely, with, with a warm up and some core at the end right. as well. And, right. Yeah, and th- they're allowed to have up to an hour and a half. So the to take lots of rest on that session, and the the primary thing is that every rep's got to be quality. So if you want to take five minutes between sets, go for it. Lift when you feel good. Right, right, right. Um, right. Our second session will be just the strength orientated session. So for girls, that will be Thursday. For the guys, that will be Friday. And because the guys are so much stronger than the girls, they tend to pull up sore. So now they only have to go through probably two more sessions on Saturday. Uh, so we try to minimize the bad rolling as much as we can, basically. But if we don't give them any strength work at all, low speeds, heavy lifting, uh, they, they, they just, because they're doing so much endurance work, they just lose strength really quickly. So, so we just need to keep maintaining it. That's the new set. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, cool. So that's the that's the current block that we're in at the moment. And right. The second match is don't change anything basically. Okay. And and, cool. and so I just want to reiterate to the audience this is a very specific time of the year. Again, they're this is peaking, you know, so this would be they're going into the Olympics, right? So rest and recovery is of the utmost importance. Um, and it's also, you know, once of every four years. So we're, we're trying to sort of, you know, it's the culmination of, of training over the last four plus years. So you're trying to make sure that everything's going right right now. So again, you're, you're emphasizing longer rest periods and, 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 um, some of those important variables. Yeah. Awesome. I'm a, I'm going to kill my video on my side because I think that's going to help improve the, the sound quality. It's, it's a little bit jumpy and dodgy. So, so I want to try to make sure that we, we get that. So I'm going to, I'm going to cancel my video out. Okay. No worries. Okay. Still hear me? Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So, um, is there anything, um, is there any differences so you mentioned you have sort of your your speed uh, speed or power session, and then the, the second session is more strength focused. Um, yeah. so, so two big points you made there. One is um, you're you're kind of doing that speed power session. I'm guessing earlier in the week, right? You said yeah. Um, yeah. so to give them a little bit more time to recover because that's kind of a more of an explosive effort. Yeah, exactly. And also, it's a session where the weights are much lighter, so they tend not to pull up sore. 
There's also no eccentric components, so there's or minimal eccentric components. So there's less muscle damage as well. It's also really important. Awesome. Now, why why is it that athletes might be feeling more soreness during a strength session, pure strength session, versus a session where they're doing lighter weights, but it's more ex, more explosive movement? The the main reason is that there's just simply more stress on the muscles, tendons, ligaments, uh, and that results in damage. Um, micro tears, um, you, you can exacerbate that if you want to in hypertrophy training and stimulate muscle growth. It's less so in pure strength training where you're in the much lower reps, you know, five or six or five or less. Uh, but there is always some level of damage and it requires recovery and, and there is stiffness and there is minor swelling and soreness associated with it. So um, that's that's basically the difference, whereas when you're uh, lifting light weights, the impact on the – although, for example, on a jump there is some impact, uh, it's maybe only 20 to 30 kilos on top of body weights for most of them. Some of the really strong guys are a bit more than that. It, uh, it results in less damage and uh, therefore – they have less stiffness. Right. Okay. Awesome. Now, the the other thing you you mentioned is that you one of the things that, that you've noticed, and I, I haven't heard this before, so this is this is really valuable piece of information is you've noticed that um, the rowing after some of the strength sessions, uh, it's not quite as you know sharp or crisp as it normally yeah. is. So, do you think that's just some of the the f- inherent fatigue that they're feeling from that, that strength training session? Yeah, exactly. We don't have the, the evidence we have for that is uh, from the Cox, especially. He, he, he'll always say to me, the boat never runs as well from this day. Um, and, and we thought about how we, and, and the coaches say exactly the same thing as well. And they're just they're most coordinated. Uh, their reach isn't quite as good. Uh, they just look less comfortable near uh, the, the catch, especially. Um, so we also, we, we think, think about that when we put the whole week together and that's the next session. The next morning is always an easy session or we like an endurance session, uh, maybe, um, five, six K. So they're quite sure what these guys are used to. And, um, and it'll also be low, low on the intensity scale as well. So it'd be a super easy endurance session. And most of the focus on that is just running the stiffness out from the well focus session the night four. Right, 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 right. Now, um, have you, when you program for, for the rowers, do you, the days that they are going to strength train, do you typically try to do the strength training sessions first? Like either it's in the morning and then they'll do the rowing in the afternoon um, is that typically sort of the, the progression that you follow or, or try to adhere to? Well, actually, the other way around. They, they strength train in the evening. And there, there are two reasons for this. One is practicality, uh, which is I'm with the swimmers in the morning, and then I get over to the rowing facility in the afternoon to pick up a little bit the rowers. Uh, so I'm just not available. Uh, but we, we've discussed this quite a lot, and there are arguments both ways, but Basically, what we want them to do after the strength session is, is go home, eat, go to sleep, and, uh, and focus on recovering as much as they can. Uh, some of them will often, they'll still do a sort of a cool down afterwards. They might go for a gentle weight session or, or jump on the bike or something like that. Um, but yeah, we, we basically want their bodies to give their body every opportunity to adapt to the weight session. Awesome. Awesome. Um, have you tried it both ways? Have you found that that having them strength train in the afternoon and, and prioritizing the, the the endurance component first, or the, their their main sport rowing being rowing in this this case, um, that yields the greatest results? Yeah, we we found both that uh, they get more quality rowing during the week. So if we strength train, particularly when we're on three sessions a week uh, earlier in the season, we end up with the next uh, all three sessions on those days in the afternoon when we're growing were just no good at all. They, they couldn't move. We couldn't get enough intensity out of them either 
that afternoon or the following morning. So we really missed out on, on the, the harder session, right. harder quality sessions. Um, so now we, that, that was probably our, our biggest change. The other thing that we've been noticing is we're getting less injuries uh, because they seem to be less fatigued. Uh, the adaptation to their strength training is better. We've seen faster results um, compared to a couple of years ago. That's awesome. That's really cool to hear. I mean, I know, I know from my own personal experience, and I'm, I'm sure you could kind of attest to it. Just that feeling of trying to trying to go from you know a, a lift, a strength training session into endurance, either very close to one another, you know, within uh, an hour or two or shorter t- time period or even later in the day, there's just this inherent fatigue that you kind of carry in your body. Um, yeah. And you're, yeah. you're just, you don't have that, that sharpness, that springiness that you usually have. Um, that's not, that's not present there. If you kind of prioritize the, yeah. you know, the endurance component first. And, so. and we also see coordination and flexibility decrease as well. So you know, sort of 12, maybe, maybe 24 hours after the session as well. So that's, that's also worth considering and, and that really affects the boat. And see, that's particularly interesting to me that you've mentioned that because you've said that a couple of times in terms of coordination. And, and to me, when I hear that, I'm thinking there's a higher proclivity for injury to occur. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And we saw that when I wasn't in the program when they had they were doing weight training in the morning. Uh, and it, it's hard to say, look at, you know, we've changed a lot of things since then not just in the strength program, but through the whole rowing program. And I think we are probably, you know, maybe taking about 80% of our injuries out. So, uh, so we made massive improvements. It's hard, like I said, it's hard to go down to one thing, but, uh, I have a feeling that may have well, well helped. That's awesome. Well, I hope, I hope anybody out there that's going to be listening to this puts that to good use, um, and incorporates that into their, their own training. Um, okay. So kind of let's, let's just segue into another topic that we, that we had here now, how, you know, what do you prioritize? What are some key things that you try to include when you're developing strength for an endurance athlete and they're, you know, obviously, you know, rowing, they're going to be earlier in the season. They're, they're doing a high amount of training volume, lower intensity, um, as they move into in competitive season, ses- the sessions are, are shortening up, but the intensity is coming up. So, how how are you kind of keeping that in mind um, and allowing them to still uh, prioritize, have really good quality sessions when they're out in the boat or on the ergometer, but still come in and, and you know have a really great strength training session and get some benefits from the from the gym. Yeah, this is. We always struggle with this, and I, just today, in fact, I, I got uh, got my lightweight men in, and and they were absolutely booked from uh, from a uh, uh, anaerobic threshold session in the morning, and uh, that's not ideal. But what we generally try to do is to have the same sort of session on the same day. So we either have a high intensity day, which will also weight So, an aerobic day and a strength day will never coincide. So, we always try to achieve the same training goal uh, on one day. The idea of training produces mixed results. No, that makes a lot of sense to me because you're trying to, if you think about it just in terms of, forget the athlete for a moment, and just think of terms of the energy systems of the human body. We want to try to line that up and stress the same energy system. So if you're if you're doing you know an endurance session on the work and then you're doing sort of a uh, you know a higher intensity explosive effort, you're utilizing completely different energy systems. Exactly right. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so follow up question to that. Now taking taking those into consideration. So if they're coming in and um, you know, the, they've done, you, 
So what, what are some of the exercises that you kind of had to adjust on the fly with that lightweight group? Cause they did some threshold work. Yeah. So th- they pretty much stick to the same program. And if you're feeling stiff, um, particularly through the back, for example, uh, they must say, all right, uh, today, uh, they have cleans and jump squats on the program. Um, we might say, you know, either we'll drop a couple of sets for them. Um, or we might just go and do some box jumps instead, so just do some body weight stuff and really take the intensity off. Um, but our main thing is when they come in, we I don't prescribe specific uh, weights for the athletes. I use them in, in the tank system. So uh, if they come in fatigued, say, all right, today is a three in the tank day. If your tank is empty, then uh, it's okay. Like you, you just go with what feels good to make sure that you've got three good reps left in the tank afterwards. Uh, it's, it doesn't sound like an enormously scientific way of doing it, but it's a, a really nice way to on the fly adjust your training intensities just based on how the athlete feels day to day. Yeah. Uh, that's a great way, um, in terms of getting, getting high quality out of them on a day to day. But the, but the other thing I like that that you kind of didn't say, but it's, it's there is that by, by doing that, you're making sure that not only are they keeping something in the tank, but they're not redlining it and getting to a point where they might put them itself, it put themselves in a position to have poor technique and get hurt. Exactly. And, uh, particularly working with the guys they are they're always really keen to lift heavy <laughs> so it's, you know, I sh- I'm not a coach who spends a lot of time shouting in the gym most of the time I'm holding them back but it, you know, these are not people who need to be motivated they're, they're certainly motivated it's more about saying well, all right let's take 10 kilos off that one you're, you're gonna hurt yourself right right yeah it, it, it's um I guess that's the there's the science part and then there's the the art part of it, right? That's it. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Now, um, is there any? So, out of curiosity, is there? Do you do sort of the same lifts for say, you know, heavyweight men versus lightweight men, uh, or men versus women? Are there are there any types of areas of the body that you feel? that you may need to account for, um, you know, men and women, for example, just in terms of strength to help balance the body out. Yeah, we find generally we find the, uh, the women tend to struggle more with, uh, with the the guys are quite resilient and, uh, we don't have many injuries within the guys, maybe a stiff back every now and again, but uh, that's been about it. The girls on the other hand, we find that the ribs are more of a problem, particularly um, backs are more of a problem. We have a lot more modified programs in the girls' uh, squads. And why that is, I'm not entirely sure. We None of us have come up with a good reason for it. But it does mean that for the girls, we are more cautious. Um, we spend a lot more time on core stability and mobility. Uh, they, they have maybe four extra sessions a week uh, that they do in their own time of, uh, of core or rib and shoulder mobility and back mobility, um, which seems to have really helped. But, uh, but why there's a difference between those two, I'm not, not entirely sure. No, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so, so you make sure that the some of the women are, are getting in um, and prioritizing a lot more uh, shoulder girdle and, and thoracic mobility, uh, yeah. making sure they're just they have the the ease of movement through um, through that area of the body. Exactly. Yeah. I, the, the core lifts remain the same. The uh, deadlift, squat, and clean is uh, makes up you know, still ninety percent of the program. Um. But yeah, it's, it's more doing a little bit of extra work from to just just help to, to ease those injuries a little bit, and maybe just keep them a bit more uh, uh, supple. Awesome. What are uh, what are some staple exercises you you might have some athletes do for for core stability training? Uh, we we like 
uh, planks, but in a you know quite a dynamic way. So um, I've, uh, I have names I've, which I pretty much make up most of the time. Uh, for example, a uh, good one they don't know is a Swiss ball up downs. So they are you know, planked on a Swiss ball, and you've simply got to go from on your elbows to uh, on your forearms to up to your hands back again. So you, you're stabilizing, you're planking, but you're introducing some kind of uh, dynamic stability as well, which I think is really important. Um, cool. You also really address core stability when they're lifting. So we try to stop them from locking down their lumbar spine with uh, with, with the large uh, muscles of the back, but they've really got to keep their back uh, straight and use their core instead rather than really overextending. So, so we talk about that a lot. So, so you're making sure that they're they're bracing. 360 degrees around um, obliques abdominals, um, not all low back, but eventually they're getting at 360 degree at spinal bracing. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. We find it, otherwise they really just end up using these large locomoting muscles through the back and, and lifting the chest. You know, sort of the, the old fashioned way of teaching deadlifts and things was to really overextend from the lumbar spine, head up. And um, yeah, we, we just they just got lazy with their cores, and uh, that seems to have had some good results as well. Awesome, very cool. Um, so let's see. Okay, let's say. Is there anything else you wanted to add on that topic? Um, in terms, in terms of also, I guess we do a lot of um, sort of single leg work. Uh, leg lifts, um, so sort of half seated stuff uh, with med in various directions, uh, throwing. Um, so sort of very all round skills on the most for the most part. A lot of rotation work as well, uh, particularly for those in the sweet rollers. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and, and thoracic extension is also important. That's right. Yeah, they're living in we're living in flexion in, in the sport of rowing. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. Um, all right, so segueing, segueing into uh, one of our next topics, um, some area not, I'm not familiar with, uh, but RSI. So, could you tell tell the audience and myself what is RSI and um, how do you use it? This is it's something I'm looking at as a, a means of assessing uh, recovery and preparedness to train in athletes. RSI stands for Reactive Strength Index. Um, generally, someone who has a high reactive strength index would be a good sprinter, for example. So the way the test is performed, the athlete is asked to do uh, 10 jumps with the instruction to jump as high and as fast as possible. So they're sort of bouncing off the toes, not locking the knees, but keeping them reasonably different. And we're then timing the uh, the contact time and the flight time. Uh, the contact time is divided into the flight time. So therefore, if you're fresh, you should be able to spend less time on the ground and jump higher. Um, if you're tired, you spend more time on the ground and jump lower, effectively. Uh, so we are proposing that this is a test uh, of... Uh, particularly the, the ability of the central nervous system to uh, to drive uh, the the muscular system, uh, and it's also it, it's been used in runners. It's been used in rugby players a lot in Australia. Um, excuse me. <coughs> so I'm just going to grab a little bit of water, mate. Yeah, no problem. Okay, yes, back. Awesome. So, 
You were talking about very, RSA. Reactive friend index, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so then you, you basically you have to build up some data for each individual. And um, we then we're tracking that at the moment against training mode, uh, which we're assessing simply uh, as a uh, rate of perceived exertion multiplied by the number of training minutes and uh, looking at that over the course of the week. Uh, in terms of practical assessment, we're also looking simply to see if there's a correlation between the two. Uh, however, I have a feeling that that is difficult with all recovery science. Uh, that recovery can take quite a lot, or fatigue can take a long time to express itself, maybe a couple of weeks. Um, so, a good way that it looks like to assess this is to simply see how someone tracks on their moving average. And uh, once an athlete has spent uh, two weeks where they've jumped, below their moving average, uh, which is made up of four weeks, uh, then we flag that as a potential issue for overtraining. We're, we don't have any strong evidence yet. We're still, uh, we're still very much in experimental stages. But uh, it's, it's something to give the coaches to, to think about and to think about training load and the fact that each individual has a, a different capacity to, to adapt and to recover. I love that. I think that's that's great. I love also how you're you're touching on the central nervous system, um, and and you know I've said this before in some other podcast interviews I've done, and it, I think it's it's so easy when we think of training to just get caught up in the uh, the physical stress, but but we have to remember that they're still a human being, and they have you know there's the mental stress that we all can experience as well as, you know, chemical or hormonal stress too. And the body doesn't necessarily distinguish between those. It's just, it's stress. And so the response is going to be the same. So that that's a great thing to be able to kind of help capture the whole picture and provide a a sort of better window into what's happening into that, that person. Exactly right. Uh, We we know, for example, we've got, Quite a few students in the uh, in team, and uh, uh, injury rates go up during exam time. Wow! Really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've had, I think, three injuries to uh, students going through their their final exams, and we didn't modify their their training stress. So suddenly they're having late nights and uh, and working hard and stressed about their exams and uh, we end up with injuries. And uh, looking back retrospectively, we're, we're understanding that we really need to appreciate what the individual is doing outside of uh, training and adjust accordingly. Yeah, I mean, that that's that makes such great sense. I mean, just, just the couple things you mentioned there, you know, higher stress because they're preparing for an exam and then you are maintaining or potentially, especially sometimes for, for students um, around exam time is also when there's bigger races. Um, And then, and then you also have a lack of sleep. (laughs) So it's like the, the perfect storm of variables happening that, that can lead to injury. Um, Wow. Very, very interesting to note. So that is hopefully, again, another another uh, gold nugget of wisdom that the, the audience can kind of put to use there. Uh, so thank you for sharing. Okay. Um, so what recommendations would you give? Um, you work a lot with athletes on sort of the, the high performance end. Yeah. So how would you, if, if a a club or a recreational rower, whether they were, um, you know, high school or, or per, perhaps um, just a rec- recreational rower, what would be some exercises, um, things that they should try to integrate into their strength training plan um, that they could do? I think you know, as a young athlete, uh, you're probably at a stage where it may well be uncertain what sport you're really going to go into. The, the most important thing is to to learn to do a bit of everything. So what, whatever kind of uh, sport you end up going into, maybe in your late teens, early 20s, uh, sure, 
you'll need to deadlift, squat, and clean. You know, there's not a strength conditioning coach in the world who's, uh, who's worth the salt who's not teaching their athletes those three uh, three exercises. So just learning that skill. And if you are lucky enough to be a very talented athlete and go into a high-performance program, the uh, most of the work is done. So often I get athletes into our programs who can't deadlift, can't squat, and often can't clean. And so we have to spend six months teaching them that when uh, we could be loading them up and getting stronger and getting a ready up on the sport. So I think that's a really important tip, that at high school level, as tempting as it's to focus on immediate performance, it's not in the best interest of the athlete in the long term. I uh, I love that. I love that. And I love how you're making a point to really emphasize, especially at a younger age, the, the foundational elements. Um, and, and I hope people appreciate, because I it stood out to me when you said it, six plus months of learning um, those lifts. You and know. I can for, for the... Right. That, that's a solid year of work to, to get a decent clean on your belt. Right. Could you... Could you just share and maybe just so, so people that may take up strength training, they kind of get a sense of one, why is it so, so important to spend that kind of baseline foundational work, learning good technique where you might not even be picking up a barbell. It might be a PVC pipe or a dowel rod and you're just working on learning the movement. Why, why is that so important? You know, there's, it's all about coordination, I guess, at the end of the day. And you know, once you start, you know, there's an excellent strength conditioning coach in Australia, now works in the UK a fair bit, uh, Calvin Giles, who, who's well worth following on Twitter. He talks a lot about movement development in children. And uh, you, you need to start with the basic skill. As soon as you start loading the skill, it's going to start breaking down. So that movement pattern has to be so strong that regardless of what you do to it, it's going to stay there. Um, so if you have a moderately okay squat and you load someone up with over 100 kilos, that squat's going to fall apart once they start getting up to around that maximum. And then you're going to run into serious injury problems. Uh, if, on the other hand, that person has practiced squatting for so long that they know nothing other than a perfect squat. Even if they're at their absolute max, they'll still deliver a good squat. And even if they fail, they'll still maintain sound movement mechanics and they'll, uh, they'll be unlikely to injure themselves. Very cool. That's great. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much because I, I think that's such an important component for especially younger athletes to realize is that, you know, take the time, learn really how, how to do the technique. You have a lot of years ahead of you to really build really good strength and, and, and get the benefits into the, the performance end of things. But if the foundation isn't solid, you know, you, you're going to either A, get injured or B, or B, you're going to sort of hit your ceiling very quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, I, you're limited by your technique. And so the, the other component of that as well is once an athlete has mastered these very basic skills, once they can you know, understand how their hips move, understand how they can shift their weight on different parts of their feet, understand that they can move their knees and their hips independently, how their back moves, how their shoulders move, that athlete becomes far more coachable as well. You can say, okay, you know, if you see, for example, a good one I'm rowing is uh, tension the shoulders and uh, closing the chest at the end of the stroke. Uh, telling someone who doesn't understand how to lower their shoulders and keep their traps relaxed and uh, use the chest, you know, it, that's, you know, there's almost pointless conversation, but if you've nailed that into them since they were 12, then, uh, then it won't be a problem. They'll, uh, they'll understand exactly what you're talking about and know how to do it. 
Awesome. Yeah. So you're, you're not only again, building some strength and adding to performance, but you're increasing the athlete's uh, body awareness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So the big three staples, as you mentioned before, just reiterating deadlift squat and clean. Yeah. Absolutely. Excellent. Do you, do you have a preference on the, um, the squat for, for back squat or, or front squat? I've been playing around with this quite a bit. We, we generally go for the back squat because, uh, cause that's where they lift the most. And, uh, at the end of the day, it's all about force production. Um, but I, I change things up during the year, so uh, I, I generally move from least specific to most specific, of course. Uh, so early in the year, they'll be doing some front squats. Uh, I've been playing around with low bar squats as well. That's kind of interesting. Um, when you go into a low bar squat, your body position is much more uh, forward leaning. And that, the deepest point, looks very much like the catch position, almost exactly the same as a catch position uh, in rowing. Uh, but as uh, it also is much more stressful on the back, so I have to be aware of that. So as a rowing intensity picks up, I then come back to a back squat, to give a sort of a, a happy medium between the, the amount of forward lean I'd like to see in the trunk, uh, but I can also really sort of load them up. Very cool. And do you find that the, the front squat can kill, help um, counterbalance some of the, the effects of the rowing stroke because they're spending so much time in flexion so the, the front squat can help uh, with thor- thoracic extension? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think mean, that's a really important part. We also use it a lot for uh, athletes with back problems. It's uh, That's a nice way to uh, keep them squatting and taking the stress off their back. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so before we move into the rapid fire, is there anything else that you want to touch on or go back on and, and add to? Um, I, probably one of the, the things that we've sort of changed the most, uh, over the last, um, two years since or three years now that I've been with, with the, the rowing boards has been, um, a massive change in our strength training from a uh, very high repetition. But when I first got there, they were doing 50, maybe even 100 reps in a set, um, which is incredibly boring. And uh, frankly, I don't know how you count to 100 while you're, while you're pushing. So <laughs> I struggled to get past 20, I reckon, before I forgot where I was. Um, <laughs> but uh, we, one of the most important things, I know that this is happening in the UK as well. They have the same approach as we do. I know that it's mostly happening. Australia at that highest level as well, um, even a little bit in New Zealand. Um, the gym is for getting strong, and the rowing is where you improve your rowing and where you uh, work your energy systems. Right. I, I, that's, I get what you're saying. That's a really important point. You're, you're making sure that the, the, the work that you're doing in the gym complements the sport, but they're still staying true to the sport and – if they're if they're going to do their work, they're doing their their high intensity work in inside their sport. Yeah, exactly. So their uh, our lifting is about generating as much force as possible. So once they move out of their hypertrophy phases, at very early in the uh, the preseason, uh, they'll never lift more than six reps in a set. Yes. All right. So so you're a lower rep you're, you're having them the, the some of their their plans their training programs are structured towards lower rep range like you yeah. said six yeah. six or under so really focusing on developing maximum maximum strength and then if they're doing some explosive type efforts i'm, I'm guessing those sets are probably even lower maybe the two to three or one to three rep range yeah yep yeah. yeah. at the moment we're uh we're going today they had five they'll uh two weeks time that they'll, they'll be down to singles. Very cool. Very cool. So, so one final question that, that I just kind of came up with, but, and I'll sort of put you on the spot. Uh, I'm just curious. So, okay. You've moved away from that, that higher rep range. I've, I've had many conversations. I'm sure you're familiar with this 
as well. In the rowing community, there seems to be a lot of tradition, and I've, I've come across many sort of older training programs where there's sort of a, a circuit or, or circuit-based style type of uh, lifting program where it's, you know, six to maybe 10 exercises in that sort of range, but it's anywhere from 10 to 20 repetitions, sometimes higher. Um, why do you think, and you can disagree, why do you think that that may not lend itself to carrying over well in, into rowing? Well, I, the main thing is if you're going to try, so circuit training is a relatively inefficient way of improving your energy systems. So therefore, if you're going to do something that's a bit like rowing, you might as well go and row. Uh, if, so then you say, right, let, let's break the sport down. What do you need? Uh, we talk about watts all the time, right? But it's like, how many watts you do on the ergo? Uh, how many watts you generate on first 10 strokes? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so therefore, it's not a particularly explosive sport. So it's a relatively slow compared to, say, track and field, for example. So the most important thing outside of the energy systems, and particularly the aerobic system, of course, contributes 80% of your uh, your rolling performance. So therefore, it should be your, your driving uh, energy system that you train. Um, from a strength component, it's getting as much force onto the blade as you can. And then the energy system training allows you to sustain that force over two kilometers. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's great. So um, we're going to move into rapid fire. This is a really fun part of the, the interview. Um, nothing to do with kind of the topic. These are all just questions I ask each guest to, to, so the audience can kind of get to know you a little bit better. Um, so here we go. So, Theo, given your uh, current knowledge level and your experience throughout your life to this point, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? Uh, ignore all the crap and focus on the basics. Fundamentals. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So not for your, the next question is for you, not for your athlete. So what is your favorite strength training exercise? Oh, cleans. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, how has your training changed today compared to 10 years ago? Yeah, it's simpler. Back to basics again. Awesome. Um, okay, next question. Have you ever had an injury? And if so, how did that injury affect your training? Wow, where do I start? I was a rugby player, so uh, so let me look. I'll wrap, I broke my leg twice. Uh, that, that had a few problems, broken a few ribs, uh, I've broken a few noses, a lot of fingers. Uh, how do they affect my training? Oh, and uh, I, I carry quite bad patellar tendonitis at the moment. So, um, so uh, the, the probably the patellar tendonitis is a really interesting one. Uh, and I've been starting over the last few months on uh, our new rehab program I've had going for the last four years, and uh, we've really moved away from the uh, the eccentric squats um, three times a day. And we're now doing uh, just uh, heavy uh, leg press, super slow, three seconds down, three seconds up. And uh, I've progressed over the last few months from uh, from that to not being able to run at all to uh, to just beginning to run now. So it's been and jumping and squatting and doing all the things I couldn't do for the last four years. That's awesome, man. That's great. So I'm really happy to hear that for you. Um, okay. What's uh, what's one thing that junior athletes should be doing more of to complement uh, their training and their health? Uh, well, a bit of everything. Playing as a wide variety of sports as possible. So not being a specialist too early. Absolutely, yeah. 
Very good. Awesome. Uh, what's your best tip to improve recovery after a training session? Uh, uh, warm down, active warm down, eat, sleep. Love it. Simple. Okay. What's your favorite meal? Uh, spaghetti bolognese. Nice. Okay. What's one book everyone should read? Uh, 1984. 1994. Who, what's that about? 1984. Is oh, 1984. Like, I thought you said 1994. No, not, uh, George, uh, George Orwell, right? No. Uh, yeah, George Orwell. Yeah, 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 George Orwell. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Future dystopian. Love it. Yeah. Um, well, hang on uh, the line so I can give you a proper goodbye, um, and we'll wrap this one up. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Leo Training Podcast. I greatly appreciate it if you would take a moment of your time, head on over to iTunes, and drop in a five-star review. Or please share it on your favorite social media network, such as Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And be sure to tune in next week as I continue uh, my content focused around the Rio 2016 Olympic Games. Uh, another rowing guest, three-time Olympian and physical therapist, Coach Bob Kaler. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.